Okay, welcome everybody uh, to Collective Intellectualities. Um, today, we are excited to have on Jan MacArthur. Uh, she's a senior lecturer in the Department of Educational Research at Lancaster University. Uh, she's informed by critical theory and particular, so her work is informed by uh, critical theory and particularly the work of Theodore Adorno. Um, and she examines issues in relation to education, social justice, assessment, and higher education. Um, today, we want to focus on a recent article that she wrote um, and published in the journal Educational Philosophy and Theory. And it's called Critical Theory in a Decolonial Age. Um, and this article is also available on the Pisa Agora website. Um, so welcome, Jan. Thank you so much for joining us. And we're, we're excited to talk about this, this article that you've written uh, today. Thank you for having me. So Jan, we wanted to start off, especially with the article, um, because it's like I always said, we really enjoyed reading it. But maybe for uh, listeners and viewers who aren't as familiar with the work that you're using in the article, can you kind of explain what is critical theory? Okay. And I know so, that's, a, that's a large question, but you know, we're seeing what no, we So critical theory can be used in a very broad sense or a more specific sense. So the term originated from Max Horkheimer, who was the director of the Frankfurt School. So it first emerged in 1937. Um, so I, my use of it is very much in the tradition of the Frankfurt School. Uh, so how I would say um, the key aspects of critical theory for them are that the organisation of society in terms of late capitalism isn't inevitable, um, necessary or, or inevitable or inevitable or benign or benign. Um, that also that human society can only be understood through the interplay of cultural, economic, social, and historical factors, that individual and social well-being are dialectically interrelated. So it's a quite a different concept of individualism than say traditional liberalism has. Um, Critical theory rejects both absolutist and relativist sort of epistemologies. So knowledge is, we can, we can know, but knowledge is hard to know and often provisional and partial. And finally, there's a focus on hidden distortions and pathologies and hidden forms of power that, that distort human being and, and social life, but that those hidden forms can often be hidden in plain sight. So they might be things that are part of our everyday lives, but we don't recognize them as things which are distorting our experience. Thank you, that's actually a really good helper. One, so one of the things too that you do in the article, taking critical theory, because it's posited that it's the decolonial age. So kind of want to follow up with that. So what is the decolonial age with how you're using it in the article? And also particularly, why is it important to think about the strengths and blind spots of critical theory tradition, especially at this moment? So uh, it's interesting, the term decolonial age, um, I haven't perhaps thought it through maybe as much as I could have. I simply meant to describe what I think is the spirit of the intellectual community at the, at the moment, both broadly social and within universities, that decolonialization I think has got to a point now where it is impossible to ignore, it is impossible to refuse to understand its basic tenets, um, if one wants to genuinely engage in open and honest and helpful public debate. So I think we are in this age, and I suppose I call it an age in a sense, I'm trying to actually not use a term like era, uh, which is sort of maybe static looking back, but to say that 
if we think of Marx in the in the article, I refer to Fraser saying that, you know, for her critical theory is about addressing the problems of the age. Well, I think the issue of how we address the need to decolonize is one of the great issues of the age. And it intersects with other important issues such as the climate emergency. Uh, so that's what I was meaning by that part. Why critical theory? Well, I suppose part of this was personal because I've used critical theory extensively in my own work. And I still believe that going back to the first generation, so particularly the 1930s to 1960s of critical theory, people like Adorno and Horkheimer, I still find their thought incredibly penetrating and useful. But what was happening in my own sort of intellectual life was that I realized I was going down this path of continuing to use critical theory. And then in other parts of my life, perhaps as a teacher, very much committed to the cause of the decolonial. And, and the tension between the two just got to a point that I couldn't bear it anymore. And I had to face a question, do I abandon critical theory because of this obvious flaw? And I didn't want to do that because actually I genuinely believe that critical theory does hold some of the answers is the wrong word, that sounds too emphatic, but some of the avenues through which we can think through some of the problems of this age. So I, I still believe that. So I went looking for a way, I went looking to think, think through, could I solve this tension? And could I ethically continue to use critical theory uh, knowing that it had this issue? And what, what was my responsibility as a Western scholar to do with this problem? When, when you're referring to uh, this problem or issue, could you elaborate a little bit on that? The, the sort of uh, limitations of critical theory or at least using it unreflectively um, in this uh, decolonial age, as you, as you put it, could you elaborate on that just a little bit? Well, critical theory is, has very, very little engagement with issues of race and issues of colonialization. And so if I start with colonialization, that's really, really strange because the core purpose of critical theory, very much based in its sort of Marxian roots, is a critique of capitalist society. And you cannot understand the emergence of Western capitalism without understanding colonialism. And you can't understand colonialism without understanding issues of race. So that these things are all interconnected. So it is just this, this enormous gap. And the more I read into it, I was sort of aware that there wasn't a lot on race. And, you know, there's the stuff on anti-Semitism, but I don't think you can conflate the two. And Edward Said, you know, has this damning critique of the Frankfurt School that for all they offered, there is just this absence. But the more I looked into it, actually, the more I realised it was a much greater problem because the whole critique of capitalism flounders unless you're prepared to address colonialism. And you can't do that without addressing race and so on. And as I looked back, I started to, much as I admire these people and um, use their work with some affection, I couldn't hide from the fact that there was a terrible absence here and that it had to be considered deliberate. Um, so before working our way a little further into um, the possible ways in which the critical theory tradition can well let me let me let me back up a little bit um so we've we've been thinking about critical theory but on the other side of this um you're talking about um de on one hand sort of like decolonial theories and indigenous philosophies and perspectives and you talk about the problems so we've kind of defined what the critical theory tradition is and you talk about problems of definition when it comes to indigenous and indigenous philosophy or non-Western theoretical uh, perspectives. 
So how do these difficulties in definition complicate the project of rethinking critical theory in relation to non-Western knowledge traditions? There's also a tension here that we wanna talk about a little bit more later between sort of academic knowledge production, like if that's like uh, indigenous philosophy or decolonial theory in the academy and also non-Western knowledge traditions writ large. I mean, this is sort of some of the problems of definition, right? And, and sort of how do we talk about um, what is uh, such a heterogeneous um, set of complicated um, systems of knowledge. Um, but you use, you also use Baba's notion of a third space uh, to help sort of orient a conversation between critical theory and, and decolonial perspectives. So could you talk a little bit about these problems of definition and how they complicate um, the project that you're engaged in here? And then also this notion of a third space as a way into um, beginning a conversation uh, between these, uh, between critical theory and non-Western traditions. Yeah, the, the, the problem of definition is both a problem for me and also part of the solution in a way. So one of the things that really, that, that actually took probably the most time writing this was my caution about to what extent I, as a Western scholar, had a right to move into this territory. Um, and, you know, and there is, there's clearly a long history of appropriation um, that Western scholars think they can just go in and visit anywhere they like and take what they like and bring it back. And, you know, so there's been an intellectual colonialism, colonialism that's been going on for some time. And I felt this tension really greatly. I thought, I don't, it's clearly wrong to not engage, but it's clearly wrong to engage in the wrong way. So that sort of informed a lot of my action. And I really looked for advice from Indigenous scholars about forms of engagement that they found helpful. And of course, many, many of them are outward looking, you know, they're, they're wanting engagement, they're just not wanting appropriation, um, or, or for, for us to say everything's commensurable. So with that dilemma in mind, I think, you know, it was very clear that one has the concept of being Indigenous, as, as I understand Indigenous scholars, such as um, Georgina Stewart have used it, is both an encompassing term and a very particular one, you know, so there is a concept of place-based knowledge and culture and philosophy, and there are very many different examples of that, and we shouldn't be looking to say that they all have to be the same in any way. So, but the other thing where I think there's a solution here is one of the reasons I like critical theory and find it so powerful, and particularly Adorno's work, is because he rejects so clearly the idea of clear definitions. And, you know, and so, so in fact, there's a, there's a Western stream here that, that it has, has something that resonates and, you know, and it can go back to nature and the whole idea that once we have an historical form of human being, you, you, can't, you can't define because it always changes. And um, so that's, that's obviously influenced Adorno. And then Adorno has his own take on this, that he refers to something like the color red. You can't actually define red. You can describe it. You can say how it feels. You probably could say what spectrum it is on the light scale, but that actually wouldn't help you to know what red is. And then in the same way, going to a, a much more important example, he talks about freedom. It's really hard to define what freedom is, but when the Nazis knock on your door at 6 a.m., you know you've lost it. So that idea that what we look for, and it's also in Walter Benjamin's work, you know, the concept of constellations, this idea that, that we can understand things, but that we destroy them if we try and tie them to strict definitions. <laughs> 
I think was a really help that I had that as part of my Western tradition, I think was a helpful way for me to be able to approach different Indigenous thought. Um, and then the, the idea of the third space, what I was looking for as I, as I looked through this, the different literature, is I was find, trying to find a place, a, a legitimate way to engage as a Western scholar, although as a Western scholar, I've got quite a complicated history because I'm Australian. And so we, I understand colonialism, if you like, in two different directions, you know, sort of, I'm both the col coloniser of Indigenous Australians, and I grew up in an era where we looked to Britain and how we wanted to escape, you know, being tied to the mother country. So it's quite complicated, but um, so I was looking for different ways to legitimise the idea that as a Westerner, I could engage uh, with th these ideas because I can't see a way forward if we don't engage. So I came up with, there were actually three that helped me in different ways. So one was Hopkins, the idea of a decolonial conversation. So it's, a con it's not just being a tolerant conversation. It's a conversation that foregrounds issues of power and the fact that power has been abused and that you know there have there have been there are historic injustices that that have never been resolved and i think barbara's third place third space is something similar it's about that recognition of power and injustice and that that has to be at the forefront of any engagement between different uh, traditions bodies of thought and then also Denzel and Lincoln had this idea of fellow travellers, which I liked very much because I, when I set out to do this, I probably went along the wrong path of trying to say, look, there's these things critical theory believes in, and it's really similar to a lot of Indigenous thought. And then I read Tuck and Yang and I thought, whoa, hold on, that's I've made a really big mistake there. You know, that claim to commensurability is, is, could be quite offensive. So I settled on the idea that mindful of this idea of a decolonial conversation in a third space, could I say that we're traveling over some similar territory and that we could, if nothing else, support one another's journey? So could you, so could you talk a little bit more? You've already done, you've already, you've already delved into a little bit um, some of the conversations that have already begun in, you know, by, um, by scholars uh, regarding the, the potential, either the incommensurability or entanglement or common ground between critical theory and decolonial perspectives. Could you talk a, a bit more about that, those, those specific um, sets of uh, conversations, common ground, incommensurability, and entanglement, and, and open that up just a bit more? Um, okay, yep. So, well, the idea of in incommensurability, is, as I said, comes from Tuck and Yang. Um, I don't think everybody agrees with it, but I think it is a fairly common sense that that looking for false connections actually again it gets back to the idea of the impossibility of definition to look for false connections actually destroys things destroys the meaning and the integrity of, of what it is and that there so so that was the challenge and it also reminds me a lot of Raymond Guest the philosopher whose work has been increasingly influential on me about the way in which we try to make historical links between different periods of time, people, cultures. And because we attribute similar terms, we think they mean the same thing. And actually we end up with really anachronistic, uh, you know, understandings. So he gives the example, that people translating from ancient Greeks came across this thing called the city and the city was sort of ruling things. So they thought, oh, that must be a city state then. And so 
we then, it looks as though through history, there's this concept of the state that goes back to the ancient Greeks and it doesn't. And I think the same thing is true in what Tuck and Yang are trying to say about incommensurability, that if you start to make these claims, oh, look, this looks a bit similar. So let's say there's a common tradition. You really end up with a, with a really um, misleading interpretation of it. But the other thing I think essential to their argument is this idea of place-based knowing. And that is a really distinctive thing. And I think it's very hard for Western thought to quite come to grips with it. I think we can appreciate it, if you like, but it's very hard to know it in the way Indigenous communities do. Um, so that's the incommensurability. In terms of the crossovers, I think there are others who say that you have the really the idea that indigenous thinkers are, are trying to romanticize a past is just really false you know this is very forward-looking philosophy and so as being part of forward-looking in an obviously globalized world however we define that the need to interact with other thought is is in one way necessary and hopefully can happen in a good way. Uh, so I think there's a need for that. I don't, I don't think many Indigenous theorists are isolationists. They just want the integrity of their ideas preserved as they come into that third space um, or whatever. But I think what's interesting is that Indigenous use of critical theory has, I think, been more sensitive than critical theorists' use of, of Indigenous, you know, so the other way around. And I think that's one of the things we have to address and learn from. And in your article, one of the ways that you do this, and you mentioned this already before, is the, um, that the idea that critical theory could be rethought as a fellow traveler, right? Rather than um, to indigenous and decolonial theory. And that's central to this, uh, the reconstruction that you offer in the article. And so, cause I found that part really fascinating. Can you describe the different ways in which you conceptualize this idea of a fellow traveler? Uh, yeah, so, so I tried to, I didn't want to say that the two bodies of thought could come together because that seemed to be stepping over that boundary of commensurability and appropriation. So I wanted to use the image that we can be, we're walking across a terrain together and we can help one another, but we're distinct. So there were a series of ways in which I said we would you know, there was a conceptual terrain that we were on. One is that both Indigenous thought and critical theory are very firmly based in the past in that they're strongly historically grounded, but that they are also forward-looking. You know, it is about, you know, uh, Nancy Fraser calls it, you know, the, that unique combination of, of imminence and transcendence based here but looking out, and I think that's something that they they having something where they they again they're fellow travellers, but doing it each in their own ways. Um, I think both challenge the Western Enlightenment, and I do think that sometimes there's a tendency amongst some Indigenous theorists, and I'm by no means criticising them for this. It's perfectly understandable to think that the Western, every, everyone in the West is in the same tradition of the Western Enlightenment. And I think critical theory is quite interesting because these are clearly Enlightenment thinkers and they're clearly grounded in, you know, Kant and Hegel and all the rest of it. But at the same time, they're the fiercest critics. So the, the dialectic of Enlightenment has been described as, you know, the blackest book of critical theory in terms of what it says about the, the state of, of Western um, society, 
So another would be that I think both um, are aware as they travel of, hid of those hidden forms of oppression that I mentioned earlier, that it's not always obvious, it's not always clear cut, and that these can sometimes be structurally embedded in social organisations, but they can also be culturally there. So I think the, the particularly Adorno and Horkheimer's focus on culture and to some extent Honneth is quite important if we think about the way in culture, the way in which culture has also been a vehicle for um, validating racism over time in society and normalizing the idea that it's okay to sort of say, well, they're different, therefore they're, you know, there's, there's a problem with difference. I think both have really interesting epistemologic, epistemological foundations in that they like mess, you know, they like, they like difficulty. It's not about tying it all up in some nice, neat sort of Western science model. It, it's about realizing that, you know, it's, it's, it's edgy and it's messy and there'll be strands and you get an understanding, but you, it's not about pinning things down in a neat way. And I think finally, that they both, in terms of the relationships among members of these societies, see individual and social well-being as, as interrelated in a way that I think makes both of them distinct from most variations of Western liberalism where society is the, the sum total of individuals, but it's their role as individuals that is always paramount. Whereas in critical theory, there's this paradox that individuality is highly valued, but it's only achieved through cooperative endeavor. So, so I think they're things they would have to talk about. They're things they could help one another with as they're both looking at this world that is still inhospitable to many of their these ideas. Um, yeah, and in reading the article, I think it 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 feels more clear how critical theory, the critical theory tradition, can be sort of expanded and enriched through engagement with um, the indigenous non-Western traditions that and, and scholarship that you're that you're um, that you're engaged with. But it's a it's a little less clear. And that was like an excellent, you've you've just done an excellent um, job of of sort of mapping out places of um, congruity and in 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 epistemological um, and theoretical engagement and sort of problem posing about, you know, modernity in the, the individual and society, the historically grounded nature of, of social life and knowledge. Um, but it was a little less clear to us what, what value or what specific kinds of ideas critical theory still offers to these non-Western ways of, of um, analyzing uh, the world and reconstructing it. Um, so, could you talk just a little bit more about that? Like, what, 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 what? And I know that you that you believe that you believe this. That critical theory does have something to offer. And if so, what specifically is it? Okay, can I answer something else that's come up in the question and then get to that bit? Yeah, if, of, if course. Just of course. Of course. So. I really didn't want to give the impression that it was the responsibility of indigenous thought to fix the problems in critical theory. You know, so one of the, one of the things I, I thought of doing at the start was co-authoring with somebody and saying what we could have. But again, I just, I was so nervous of crossing that line of appropriation. So one of the things I think what I was trying to say about critical theory is not just that it would do well to expand its, you know, horizon 
and read these other things, but that it needs to go back through its own history. We need to go back to things like the dialectic of enlightenment. We need to go back to that whole thing about instrumental rationality, which is so powerful in critical theory, but which when they when that emerged as their response to how on earth Nazism happened in Germany, the fact that they didn't see the racial element is really problematic. So for their own sakes, or for my sake, as someone who wants to use it, we have to go back and fix our own history. And, and that's where um, uh, Wehali's work was really important to me. And when I suddenly understood, yes, how could they not see that the Holocaust was about race in the sense that it was about dehumanizing and that all that was different was this time, the people who were called non-humans or part humans were white Europeans. But other than that, it's what had been happening for centuries. So, so, in a sense, so in a, I just want to clarify that. I think critical theory has to go back and fix that because it was wrong, um, not to be too definitive about anything. So what value to, to non-Western? I suppose I'm not really trying to say in terms of epistemology or philosophy, it necessarily does have to. I'm more proposing that we could be allies um, it's, it's a harsh neoliberal world out there of, you know, political populism and all of that. I mean, you know, you, if you look at the governments of, of uh, you know, recent times in the US and the UK and Australia and Brazil and, you know, there's a lot that we're trying to deal with if you believe in progressive social theory and progressive social action. So I think having allies is quite a good thing. For me, it's almost secondary, the fact that at some point then I think this will, it, it does enrich to share ideas, but again, not to lose that sense of the integrity of, of the different people's positions. So I think I was seeing it, so I, I wrote in the end, the only ethical decision I could make about how to write this article was that I wasn't going to presume to speak for Indigenous scholars. I would use some of their work to the extent that I had to, but that I only had a right to speak as a Western critical theorist. And so I suppose it's more of an offer to say, we could be your ally if you'd if you'd accept us for all this awful racial myopia that's there in in the history of critical theory um, rather than me saying you should learn this or you should learn that and i think with that too um it kind of comes back full circle to what you described in the beginning of our talk with the impetus for wanting to write this article where you felt there was this tension between, um, you know, your use, like, critical theory. So you come to that point where how do I try to resolve or find a way to maneuver through this tension? And I'm wondering if these issues, maybe they speak to an, another underlying tension that we felt circulates in the article as well. Um, between what we spoke about before with academic knowledge production, which remains largely um, rarefied and privileged, and is increasingly a market incentivized process. And then the lived realities of real people in real communities engaged in real struggle. And so how do you, to kind of come to an end full circle, how do you conceive of this tension between academic knowledge production and its efficacy within and outside higher education, right? So I'm kind of how it may be in another way of putting it, but through writing this article, having these discussions, how has that tension um, for yourself with this become, if resolved at all? That's a really good question. That's probably in another article. Um, so, but, so I think that, 
one of the things that if we go back to the point i'm not i'm not trying to say indigenous thought should you know help out critical theory but certainly what critical theory can learn from it is that uh, knowledge creation engagement and enrichment doesn't just occur in certain rarefied institutions um, so I think that's an important point, but I, th I think it's something again that would be could be considered a common plane in both traditions, because critical theory itself, uh, the original Frankfurt School was deliberately set up to be outside the formal German higher education system, so that it could think those things that were unthinkable within a traditional university. And also a very big theme of it is this sense of moments of exile or sanctuary that in order to understand how do, how do we how do we work for greater social justice within an unjust system how do we resist the mainstream when we're part of it um, and all of that you know how do we resist the status quo when we're so bound up in ensuring it keeps going and I think this is where universities have, in a sense, a, a heroic and an evil role. So they can, as you say, increasingly marketize places and they can be cutting down these opportunities all the time. I suppose the bit of me that wants to hold on to hope is that I still see a role for universities as places where we can find moments of sanctuary for thought, and this is pro this is probably this is where my my latest work is going in terms of understanding what that is. But I do think it's also if we go back to the spirit of critical theory, even though we find it a lot, you know, we're talking about these white European men in their universities. The actual essence of the ideas is about knowledge having more diverse forms and being created in different ways. And certainly where you have the extrapolation of it into critical pedagogy, you have many examples there of the democratization of knowledge. So I think you're right. I think there's a tension in critical theory because I think on the one hand, it can seem quite elitist and, um, and it, can, it can be in just in the sense that it's incredibly hard to penetrate um, you know, from the outside. But I think that we can rescue from some of its core ideals, though, principles of democratizing, broadening other forms of knowledge, because if we, unless we have those, we can't resolve this problem of hidden forms of oppression. So, um, so, that's, so that's more attention within critical theory. And I think you're, you're, you're right, though, that the situation is really quite difficult and it may well be that we are going to, I don't want to have a golden age view of universities as though there were once wonderful sanctuaries for, you know, great emancipatory thought because universities have always been institutions of power and privilege, you know, from their very, very beginnings, they were established, you know, to ensure some groups had privileges over others. But I do think we can see some principles that have emerged over time that are, are still aspirational. But what worries me is that we're going to lose, we are losing those spaces, um, which is perhaps gets back in a circle to that's why we need allies, you know. So we've just got to this position. If I think of when I left Australia 25 years ago, or when I first encountered Indigenous thought as a high school student, what has happened in that intervening time is massive in terms of universities embracing and understanding, appreciating the richness of, of diverse um, epistemologies and cultures. And I suppose it gets back to that point we started at the start, we're, we're in a decolonial age. We're in the decolonial age at the same time, we're in this increasingly marketized 
and all of those tensions. So what we need to do is look to help each other to, to stop this. Because what is shame to have had this flourishing of Indigenous thought and then just turn it into something where universities sell tea towels of Aboriginal art, you know, it's just, it, it's just not what it's about. And I, that pressure is always there because the, the, the status quo is so powerful because it's relentless and because it mutates and transforms. So it gathers up any new, you know, areas of different thought or resistance, different other ways of thinking, it can gather them in and domesticate them. And so I think we have to be allies in, in opposing that as best we can. I've probably drifted from your question there a little bit, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's sort of precisely what we were, or at least, at least what I was thinking about in, in reading this is just how do these, how, how, did, how do these theoretical and conceptual resources which I also believe are, are incredibly useful for um, just developing a greater understanding of what's happening around us um, and what's happened historically and um, one's individual personal biography place in the world way of um, relating to oneself and others. Um, how, you know, that gap between this sort of relentless publishing machine, market incentives to publish, theory as a kind of, you know, careerist uh, endeavor, and, you know, just that gap between real people, real lived concrete situations, where these ideas, yeah, they can be useful for deconstructing and, and possibly assembling new ways of, um, resisting or reconstructing, you know, uh, you know, or, or, or thinking through very specific problems in very specific contexts. Um, but, but that gap is, a gap is an important one to be thinking through, you know. So anyway, I'm sorry, I, uh, rambling on here a bit at the end, but, um, but thank you for that. And it's, it's been wonderful to, to have this um, discussion with you. And thank you for coming on. Thank you. It was, it was lovely. Thank you.